Mystery Revealed. Today's case is about Mariette Bosch, who was the first white woman to face the death penalty in Botswana. Now before we get into it, here's a quick disclaimer. I mean absolutely no disrespect to anybody mentioned in this video. All this is information found on the internet and I have compiled into one video. We will be discussing murder, adultery, mental health and religion. So if these are your triggers, please be warned. Mariette Bosch was the first white woman to face the death penalty in Botswana. She was the fourth woman to face it since the country gained its independence in 1996. At that time, South Africa had long abolished the death penalty. Mariette Bosch was born in 1995 and was used to the finer things in life because her father was a wealthy liquor store owner. What kind of woman was Mariette? Mariette was a very loving person. She was... Uh a soft person. I think she was quite a sociable person and uh, therefore quite likable. You know, in the church circle she was known for the lady who can produce the best milk tart in the territory and uh, she was often applauded for that. Was she a religious person? She was certainly a religious person and an uh, integral part of her particular church circle. When she married her intimidating, short-tempered husband, life was not always sunshine and roses for them. Justin Bosch cheated on Mariette, but Mariette decided to overlook it and they had three children together. What kind of man was Justin Bosch? Justin was a client of mine. I knew him well. He was um, a big man, but not only physically, he was a fairly positive, forceful sort of person. And he had a, a positive attitude to life and quite a domineering personality, I would say. <laughs> In 1992, 42-year-old Mariette and her husband decided to relocate to Botswana, Gaborone, from Petersburg, South Africa. The diamond industry, the thriving economy and low crime rates is what influenced them to move here. Mariette was looking for peace and stability when she moved to Botswana. She and her husband settled down in the affluent neighborhood of Pakalani. The white South Africans often referred to it as Little Sentin as this is where all the rich people stayed. The community the Boshes moved into was mostly full of white South Africans that often hired Botswana maids and garden boys. They were surrounded by golf courses, shopping malls, casinos in which Mariette and her husband enjoyed daily. The family had two cars, one of them being a brand new BMW. Mariette had become a member of Botswana's High Society and she also began to attend the Dutch Reformed Church regularly. Moving into the neighborhood was Ria Vomerens and her husband Timmy Vomerens. The couples became friends but the two women considered themselves to be best friends. She was a perfectionist and she was a bit dominant but we got along very well. I was told that she was a really no-nonsense woman, very straightforward and uh, spoke her mind. Yes, no, that's, that's Ria, that's Ria. Yeah. She wanted to say something, she said it, and she didn't take nonsense from nobody. They did several activities together, like baking class, a class for decorating porcelain dolls, and even went on school runs together. Unfortunately, in 1995, Justin got involved in a fatal car accident with a new car that he was test driving. He had went to Zeros to drop off his son Anton at boarding school, but when he came back, he got involved in this accident. Unfortunately, he did not survive. There were rumors that there was something sinister about Justin's death, but those were just rumors, and they were quickly dismissed. Now, this whole time, Mariette was having an affair with her best friend's husband, Timmy. It was later revealed that the affair actually started in 1993 when Tini and Ria had separated. 
but the couple later got back together and decided to work on their marriage. And what was the marriage like between Tini and Ria? In the early days, uh, very happy, mm. very happy. But I don't know, I can't, I can't really put my finger on where, when things really started going wrong. Behind the scenes, it seems like Tini kept promising to divorce Ria, but he never did. And Mariette grew more and more impatient by the day. So far, little is known about the victim who was so brutally murdered. Ria had led a seemingly normal, happy family life until Mariette Bosch entered the scene, an event which would change the course of Ria's life. Sixth of June, 1996, Ria Vomarines was carrying a tray of teacups from her lounge to her kitchen, and she was shot point blank range. Her neighbor, Mrs. Janet Square, testified that she heard two gunshots at about quarter to nine that evening, but because she couldn't see anything in the Vomarines' house, she ignored it. Earlier that evening, Mariette had given her daughter Charmaine and her boyfriend Ruan money and asked them to invite Ria's daughter Marina out for supper. At this time, Tini was on a work trip in Maung, so Ria was definitely home alone. Now, Maria's request was very unusual because Marina and Charmaine didn't usually hang, hang out and they didn't usually hang around the same circle. At about 11 o'clock that night, Charmaine and Ruan dropped off Marina at home and as she entered, she found her mom laying on the passage floor with broken teacups shattered all over the floor. Despite the fact that Ria had been bleeding to death, Marina claimed that she didn't realize that her mom was dead, so she called the neighbors, including Maria, for help. The police arrived shortly after that. As I mentioned before, Ria was home alone on the night the night that she was killed, as Tini was working away from home. She almost certainly knew the person that killed her and probably let them in voluntarily as there was no sign of forced entry. She had been making a cup of tea when she was short and the tea tray and its contents were found beside her body. Two 9mm bullets had been fired at her and she was found by her, her daughter Mariana later that evening. It looked like a burglary that had gone tragically gone wrong my mom was very you know she wanted to know these things and she said in a comment she wondered if Ria died instantly or did she suffer and he says ma don't worry it was unblicklik say was unblicklik do it and that that grated my mom terribly because I know she read the when Interpol was here she read the autopsy and apparently Ria didn't die instantly she bled to death Tina and Mariette rented a house a month after Ria's death and according to them their relationship only became serious about two months later. In September 1996, three months after the murder, they secretly got engaged and told their families that they were going to South Africa to shop for wedding outfits. That is so suspicious. Your wife just died and you're here already planning on marrying your side. Mm -mm. Ain't no way boy. Ain't no way. Now. In early June 1996, it turns out that Mariette had borrowed a 9mm browning pistol from a friend in South Africa who had been looking after her late husband's firearm collection on the basis that she wanted to do some target shooting. Now, Mariette smuggled the gun into Botswana. Mariette made two mistakes that were to provide crucial evidence against her. She told Judith Walsh, her sister-in-law, who still lived in South Africa, that she was in love with Tini and that they wanted to marry. She also gave the gun to Judith's husband after the murder. Judith Bosch remembered a phone call she had received from a friend in the morning after the murder, informing her of Ria's death. She asked the friend about the murder weapon and was told that it was a 9mm automatic pistol. The friend who was looking after the family's firearm collection had earlier told Judith that Mariette had wanted to borrow one of the guns. When Judith found out about the killing and the weapon, the weapon she used, she persuaded Mariette to return the weapon to her. 
Judith then handed the gun over to the police and forensic tests showed that the gun they recovered was the murder weapon and they later arrested Mariette and Tini on October 7th, 1996. Now, Tini had a solid alibi for the night of the murder. He could prove that he was working away. For three months after Mariette's arrest, she refused to talk to the police about the gun. She didn't even give Tini a good reason as to why she brought the gun to Botswana. But eventually, she made a statement that, that claimed that Hine Kuti persuaded her or forced her to bring the gun into the country. Now, Mariette was granted bail after 10 months in custody and came into trial 18 months after the murder. She and Tini got married in 1998 while Mariette was on bail. So Tini married the woman that was being accused of his wife's murder. Tell me that's not sus. Like, just tell me that is not sus. Anyways, Mariette's trial opened in December 1999 at Botswana's Lobatse High Court before Justice Isaac Abwahe. As is normal in Botswana, there is no jury and the judge has to find the verdict. So according to the prosecution, it was Mariette who had climbed over the wall in the Vormarens garden, entered the house and shot Ria. Now Mariette claimed that she was overweight at the time of the killing, therefore she could not have jumped over the wall. But this was rejected by the court on the basis that she could have had a set of keys. Considering that this was her best friend at the time's house and her, you know, her man that she was seeing in secret. Much more of the damning evidence against her came from her sister-in-law Judith regarding the gun and the affair. Mariette admitted to borrowing a gun from a friend, but claims that she did so after being hypnotized by Hini Kutsi, Ria's former boss. She accused him of being the killer, which he denied. It was suggested that Hini had put some sort of drug into some wine that he and Mariette were drinking, and that he then told her to go get the gun and bring it to him, but not to mention it to anyone. Hini's alleged motive was that Ria had uncovered financial irregularities Larities in his company and that these would be revealed at a forthcoming audit. Now for the defense, it was pointed out that there was no direct forensic evidence linking Mariette to the murder. There were no fingerprints on the gun, nor in Ria's home. It was also suggested by the expert witness, psychiatrist Dr. Louis Olivier, that Mariette did not have a killer's profile and could not lie, but this was dismissed by Justice Abuache as of no consequence. Mariette's alibi was that she had been ho home all evening, and this was verified by her daughters, but her maid said that Mariette had gone out at around 8 p.m. There was, there was like a very strong circumstantial case against Mariette, and with no dispute about the fact that she had brought the murder weapon into the country and a strong possibility that she and Tini were having an affair before Ria was killed. A disputed alibi for the night of the crime and a very clear motive. But on the other hand, her defense was rather fanciful. So not surprisingly, therefore, on the 31st of, December, of February 2000, the judge found her guilty and rejected any claim that she had acted under the influence of another person. He said that it will be difficult to find a crime more devoid of anything that could reduce blameworthiness of the accused person. I have searched the trial records to find anything, however minute, to reduce your blameworthiness, Judge Isaac told her. I have not been able to find anything. The crime was carefully planned with the motive of enabling you to take over the husband of the deceased. It was committed with no mercy for the innocent victim. You desired to eliminate the, dece the deceased in order to be able to marry her husband. I have no doubt the crime was premeditated. It took 30 minutes for Isaac Abuero to deliver his full judgment and at the end asked Mariette if she had anything to say before she was sentenced. She replied, I am not guilty. You are, my lord sentencing a woman for something she did not do. He then adjourn, adjourned the court for five minutes before returning to pass sentence on her. 
The cart rose and donning the, clap, the black cap, he told her, You'll be returned to prison and there be hanged by the neck until you are dead. Your body will be buried in such a place as the state present may determine. May the Lord have mercy on your soul. Mariette's daughter, Charmaine, who was 20 years old, was stunned by the verdict and the sentence and had to be comforted by relatives while her, while her younger brother, Sone, tried to chase after her mother as she was led from the court after the guard, but was not allowed to contact them. Mariette was taken to Khaburuni Central Prison and placed in solitary confinement on death row to await her appeal. Although Mariette had been given the death sentence, it was not felt by Tini and her friend her family that it will ever be carried out as they expected to win the appeal. Tini maintained that allegations against Tini could see, although no evidence was found of the supposed financial irregularities of the subsequent audits. A provision put in place when Botswana became independent from Britain in 1996 gave condemned prisoners the right of appeal to the Botswana Appeals Court, which comprises of judges from England, Scotland, South Africa, Zimbabwe and Nigeria. The members of the Appeal Court, which sits twice a year in January and July of each year, included President included Judge President Timothy Okuda from Nigeria, Sir John Blofield from England and Lord Weir from Scotland. I'm pretty sure I'm butchering these names. Accompanied by 15 members of the Botswana Prison Guard and Police Force, Mariette, who had turned 50 the week before, entered the packed court promptly at half past 9 a.m. on the morning of the 18th of January. She blew a discreet kiss towards Tini and sat down to listen to the proceedings. The year Mariette had spent in death row had taken a cons considerable toll on her. She had lost a considerable amount of weight and had and had aged badly. She was wearing a lilac blouse, which appeared too big for her, a little makeup, and had her hair in a ponytail. The case against Mariette was presented by Botswana's Assistant Attorney General Lizzo. He told the court, We are talking about a woman who decided in advance that the deceased was an obstacle to her relationship with Tini and would have to, get, and would have to be gotten rid of. Lizzo said Mariette and her daughter Shamino had contradicted themselves in the testimony during her trial, and this proved that the High Court had been right in finding her guilty. These contradictions affected the plausibilities of the entire defense. He also said that Mariette had lied about her alibi on the night of the murder. Lizzo said she claimed to have been home, but this had been denied by her maid. Furthermore, he said Mariette had told the court that she had left the murder weapon at a police post on the South African side of the border, but then later said that she had given the weapon to state witness Hinikutsi, neither of which statements were true. For her defense, top London barrister Desmond Da Silva argued that the trial was flawed because Hinikutsi was given immunity for testifying against Mariette without the court or defense being informed. The witness had demanded and got an immunity for which did not even specify that he had to tell the truth as far as I can see. He said that it's astonishing. Evidence that Mariette had a dependent and vulnerable personality was easily suggestible and was presented at the appeal. The crucial point was who, if anybody, influenced Mariette to commit the, the crime. Was it Hini Kutsi, was it Tini, or was it somebody else? Unfortunately, we'll never know the answer to this, and indeed to who fired the fatal shots. On the 29th of January, the appeal court gave its judgment, which lasted for nearly two hours. Acting judge, President Timothy Aguda, told the court that she is a wicked, despicable woman. The murder had been planned over a long period, no doubt as a result of jealousy and infatuation. It involved traveling to South Africa where she collected a gun and she legally brought it into the country. The appeal was thus denied. Mariette was visibly shocked when the three appeal court judges delivered their ruling. Tini was too upset to speak and admitted that there was very little hope of a reprieve. After the appeal was dismissed by her lawyer, Edward Asholi, 
Luke 11, began preparing a, an appeal for clemency for Mariette. The appeal was thus denied. Mariette was visibly shocked when the three appeal court judges delivered their ruling. Tini was too upset to speak and admitted that there was very little hope of a reprieve. After the appeal was dismissed, her lawyer, Edward Fashow Luke, began preparing an appeal for clemency for Mariette, where the death sentence is upheld on appeal. The case is considered by the advisory committee of the prerogative of mercy, which advises the president on the exercise of his prerogative. The president of Botswana, Festus Morai, said while on a visit to London on March 29th that he would not consider granting Maria clemency. However, it was therefore up to Botswana's commissioner of prisons, Joseph Oroboze, to arrange a sentence to be carried out. And it was to be the first hanging there since that of five men in August 1995. Mariette spent her last days on death row wearing a brown prison dress in a single cell with just a mattress and a baguette. The standard prison food included tripe and morojo, and she's reported to have had nightmares about standing on the gallows while strangers around her whispered in a language she could not understand. On Friday the 30th of March, Mariette's death warrant was read to her and she was informed that her execution would take place in the early hours of Saturday. She was not permitted any visitors or to say goodbye to her family, nor was she allowed a special last meal. She was apparently cancelled, wrote letters to Tini and her children and prayed. Sedatives were not offered to condemned prisoners, as was also the case in Britain. A minister of the church, the prison doctor and prison officials witnessed the hanging, which was carried out British style at 6 a.m. that morning. Executions in Botswana are carried out in, co out in complete secrecy, and no details whatsoever are released in advance. Warning of an execution is normally given. After, the death, after death, her body was buried in the prison cemetery. Now it turns out that three weeks earlier, Tini had made an appointment to visit Mariette on the Friday. This appointment had been confirmed by the prison officials, but when he phoned them on that Friday morning, he was told by a senior officer that they were busy with an infection and that an inspection and that all visitors for the day had been postponed. Instead, he was told he was told to come back the following morning. Because I came into chambers in the morning, and my staff who had grown quite fond of her, told me that uh, she had been executed. And I said, no, that's not possible. And they said, we heard this over the news. She has been executed. And of course, I spoke to someone who confirmed that it had in fact was the position. I learned of the execution in the Radio Botswana News Bulletin on Monday morning at 7 o'clock. Um, uh, I was just going to take a shower and then I heard in the news that Mrs. Bosch had been executed on Saturday. And then um, immediately Mr. Omarans called me to say that um, he has received a call from the prison's department saying that um, he must attend at prisons immediately because there was something that they needed to discuss with him and that he should attend with his lawyer. So um, I went to the prisons at 8 and um, we were called into a room and that's when we were told that she, she had been executed on Saturday and um, her, her belongings were there, they were given to the family. Yeah. Um, I was particularly devastated, mm -hmm. you can imagine, um, having been the lawyer, and the family was particularly devastated, um, mostly the children. Now on the Monday when the execution was announced, Botswana's permanent secretary at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ernest Mpofu, said that the law did not provide for a condemned person to be allowed a last visit by his or her family before the execution. When Tini was refused access to Marriott on Friday, he had contacted Anne Schofield, his British lawyer, who was working on the documents that needed to make an application to Botswana's clemency commission for a stay of execution. The documents were nearly completed and were expected to be ready to fix through Balman's lawyers on in Khaburuni on Monday morning. Whether they would have considered them as however debatable as they had reached their decision.
Why do you think she was executed so swiftly? A number of things, but one of the major ones was the international pressure. Um, we were receiving calls as well. There's a group from Italy called Hands Off Cain, which we'd, we'd never heard of before. And they contacted us. They wanted to know about Marietta Bosch. And I reminded them that there were two Southern Africans on death row, one black and one white. That's right. And they were not interested in, in Kobedi, whom, as you know, whose case is still He's going now, on now, yeah, it's still yeah, going on. Yeah. All they wanted to know was about Marietta Bosch. And of course, in 1999, we had been involved in the death penalty case relating to Tsubasara. We hadn't had such international coverage. Right. And so even for the average Motswana, it was like, but what's so special about this case? And of course, the noticeable difference was that Marietta was white. And right. all the other people who had been executed were black. And there'd been no focus on them. Um, and there were some people who opposed her being executed, those few who spoke out, uh, because she was a woman, you know, that women shouldn't be executed. But of course, our position is we're opposed to the death penalty, whether you're a woman or white or oh, green yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, so you had that element, um, the, the sort of what appeared to be interest merely because she was white. Um, then you also had the element where our president um, clearly articulated a position of sovereignty. Yeah, Botswana is a sovereign state. We have internal rules. She went through the legal system. High Court, she was legally represented. Court of Appeal, she was legally represented. At no point did she not have a lawyer. It was a lawyer of her choice, etc., etc. And the matter went to the clemency stage. After execution, Tini was interviewed by South African media and, com and he commented, the manner in which Mariette was executed was totally and completely indecent. I cannot, I cannot fulfill the reason for it. We have filled a petition for clemency and it was a preliminary petition which we made clear to President Mohaya that we needed time to prepare for a full petition. We also told him that we were arranging for his psychiatrist to evaluate Marriott's state of mind. My lawyers did not even have time to write a report before Marriott was executed. He said, we received a letter, myself, Sonne, Shamin and Anton. It was addressed to us from Marriott. Inside was a short note for each of us. She had not been allowed to write it herself. She had been told to dictate it. She said that they did not want her to see us on Friday. I believe that the story they told us about an inspection was a lie. They will probably make up anything now. I found out that the pastor who was visiting her every week was not allowed to see her on Friday too. Mariette had no one to comfort her and nobody to try and help her to be with her in her final hours. She has denied the common decency of being allowed to talk to a priest. I cannot even begin to imagine what she must have gone through. Upon hearing of his wife's execution, Tini flew into an indignant rage. He vowed that he would die to prove Mariette's innocence. I've made a promise to her that the truth shall be revealed one day. And Marit, I know that you hear me. I know that you hear with us, with God. I shall keep that promise. And I love you. Now, it is believed that the only reason why there was so much controversy around the case is because Marriott was a white woman. Now, remember that we said that before then, f only four women had been hung and none of them had caused such an international controversy. It was also believed that the reason why Marriott was hung so quickly after her execution was because of the international growing controversy over the case and the increasing pressure from various human rights groups. Sadly, Mariette had no real defense other than some other theories against the strong circumstantial evidence, so it was not surprising of the balance of probability she was found guilty. Her case received huge publicity in the South African media and also in other English-speaking countries, as capital cases involving white middle-class women were always rare. It's, it is difficult to see any real reason why the president would have forgiven her or politically could have done so how can it be right to reprieve this prisoner because she's white while executing others who are black keep in mind that Botswana had hung three black women before Mariette 
how would their relatives feel if Marriott had been reprieved purely because she was white? Inverted racism may have also played a part in the decision to execute Marriott because she was a wealthy white living in a black country. Now, whether or not Marriott deserved death for this matter, matter is a matter of personal opinion. Let's not forget Rhea Vormitz. Did she deserve to be deceived and abandoned by her husband and to die by shooting because she was a bar to Mariette and Tina's relationship? She too had human rights. Now, thank you so, so much for staying with me throughout this case. Please give me your thoughts in the comments below. Um, also, don't forget to comment a purple heart if you have made it this far. Like I said, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for listening to this podcast. And I hope to see you guys in the next episode. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share with your friends. Bye, guys. I love you guys so much. And thank you guys for the support once again. Bye.